tonight to facilitate our conversation around a very important, it's not one subject, in fact, it's a, a number of subjects. Um, I don't know how many of us um, care to follow the words of the introductory song about Africa, independence, freedom, and there are bylines there, like we are the generation, we have no time to wait. Very profound message for our continent and our country within that continent. I welcome you all and uh, hope that we, we all have a fruitful and reaching engagement this evening. Our subject is debt and corruption, the cost of it to our country. I want to assume that we've all had opportunity to go through the concept note for this dialogue, so I'm not going to waste our time. I will uh, ask Ibo to welcome us for three minutes or not more than three minutes. Then I will invite us to come into discussion as follows. Uh, I will welcome Tendai Biti, who will do the keynote or main presentation for our discussion this evening. And he will have not more than 30 minutes in which to do that. And then I will ask uh, Janet uh, to do a commentary for not more than 15 minutes, and then I will ask um, can you hear me? Uh, our, our second discussant also to do not more than, I'll ask Chennai, uh, our second discussant to do her critique again of not more than 15 minutes. Then at the end of that first hour, I will ask our three presenters to very briefly, two at no, not more than uh, three minutes each, any observation comment on the other's presentation that will not last more than 10 minutes. And then we will have our discussion. 
when we come to the discussion, I would like to appeal to all of us to be very brief and very precise. We can ask a question of any one of the discussions, or we can make a comment on, on, on any of the subjects that will have been addressed by the keynote speaker and the two discussions, but not do our own presentation. So as we can all have as much time as possible. Thank you, Simba. Engage. Can you all hear me? Issues. Thank you very much. On that note, may I invite Ibo to please welcome us two minutes. Thanks, Simba. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? David? Yes, yes, yes we can hear you. Yes, my, my job is really a very simple one. Simba has done a very good introduction. So it leads me just to introduce him as our moderator today. And there are a number of reasons why we chose him as our moderator. The main of which he was, uh, is a former minister of finance. It reminds me of the, uh, and therefore uh, we thought Simba would be best placed uh, 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 since we also have a former minister of finance in the community development in diabetes, that we will have a very rich discussion on a very controversial subject, the debt and corruption, what's the real cost? And so I leave to, uh, Simba now to take over and do what he knows best. Simba. Thank you, Ibo. I will not introduce our main speakers uh, so as we don't waste time on matters that we are all able to access uh, at our leisure in our time. So it is my pleasure to invite Tendai Biti to give us his wisdom. Tendai, thank you. Tendai, are you here? Yes, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me, Doc? I can hear you now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, it's a privilege to, to get invited to these discussions uh, uh, by, by SAPES and my Sekuru, uh, Dr. Mandaza. Um, uh, and I wish we had many of these conversations uh, in our country because the issues uh, are really critical. And I, I mourn the fact that um, uh, we are a very visceral uh, space uh, dominated by very extractive uh, and oftentimes uh, toxic uh, debates, uh, particularly on social media, very limited uh, debates. So I welcome this uh, very cerebral uh, interrogation on the polity of our debt uh, and corruption in Zimbabwe. I think the key question that is asked is what is the cost? Uh, what is the cost of debt uh, and corruption in Zimbabwe? Uh, we can try to put mathematical figures, as I will try to do uh, later on in my, in my, in my address. But my, uh, my submission is that uh, corruption and debt uh, represent uh, the monetization of the totality of what we call uh, the Zimbabwean uh, crisis. Uh, corruption and debt capture uh, and, and monetize, uh, conflict uh, the Zimbabwean crisis, whether it must it manifest itself as in a country uh, divided, a country where the a uh, social contract uh, is, 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 is broken, a country where there is no domestic and international uh, legitimacy, where there is disengagement, where there is violence, where there is conflict, where there is uh, 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 extractive institutions and intolerance. And so the sum totality of all that is expressed uh, in uh, the debt and um, a corruption conundrum uh, in, this, uh, in, 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 in this country. Uh, they, they, the, the debate asks us to examine the rise of the securocratic state in Zimbabwe. 
more importantly, the rise of the deep state, for it is in the deep state that you find this murky, incestuous uh, relationship, incestuous uh, marriage between a very extractive state and its agents and a, a multinational corporation and cartels that are running and controlling uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, and when you go deeper into particular corruption, you see the pervasive presence of this cartel, cartels who only exist purely because of their synergies, chemistry and connection uh, with the state, with, with the government, with characters in the upper echelons uh, of the of the of the of the Zimbabwean uh, state. And that is uh, I, I, I sense some interference. I'll, I'll continue. And that is the reality. Continue tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start off with uh, I'll start with uh, external debt. We all know that uh, Zimbabwe has been in the throes of an unsustainable uh, debt crisis since uh, the late uh, 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 90s, uh, if, you, if you want. Uh, a combination of uh, fiscal deficits, standard growth, high, uh, high debt service uh, obligations uh, have resulted and resulted in our country uh, defaulting uh, on debt uh, in uh, 2000. And so as, as I speak to you right now, we have huge areas and an unsustainable stock of debt uh, with the Paris Club of uh, Lenders, with the World Bank, with African uh, Development uh, 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 Bank. In his uh, mid-term review statement presented on the 28th of July, uh, 2022, uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Professor Mutuli Ngube, disclosed that the stock of external debt, uh, external sovereign debt, uh, was around uh, 12 billion uh, US uh, dollars. Uh, that figure on its own is heavily uh, contested. And I'll just summarize uh, the breakdown uh, of this publicly, privately uh, uh, guaranteed the PPG external debt uh, in US dollar terms. So he puts the figure at $13.153 billion, of which the Paris Club of Lenders are owed around $5.4 uh, billion. Uh, the World Bank and multilateral creditors are owed around $2.5 billion, of which $1.4 is, is owed to the World Bank. Uh, 686 million owed to the African Development Bank, uh, the European Investment Bank around 350 and others around 7 million. The RBZ external debt is put at around $4.9 billion. And that gives you a total of around $13.153 billion. But there's no credibility in this figure. Uh, only three weeks ago, uh, the Minister of Finance, thanks to questions from members of parliament, was forced to disclose that the government of Zimbabwe actually owes the Republic of China US $2.7 billion, which has hardly been serviced uh, through uh, through loan servicing and so forth. And I know from my work, during as chair of the public accounts committee, uh, we did a report on the reserve bank, uh, which actually showed that the reserve bank's external debt is actually around 8.5 uh, billion uh, US, uh, US uh, uh, dollars. And we also know that they are, there is literally every day, uh, uh, the incurrence of increased external debt uh, by the government through the contracting uh, of uh, sovereign debts that are bypassing parliament. We all know that in terms of section 327 of the constitution of Zimbabwe, every agreement and treaty 
that imposes a fiscal obligation must have prior approval of parliament. And I would like to submit that 90% of these new loans are not being approved uh, through a parliament. We also know that there are other debts that are expressed in US dollars that they've not acknowledged. For instance, the 3.5 billion US dollars that we have uh, uh, indebted ourselves to the commercial farmers in respect of improvements. One of the frightening documents that I came across in the process of my research is the, is the 2023 uh, budget strategy paper, uh, which was uh, uh, published and released by the Minister of Finance on the 28th of uh, uh, July, 2022. If you go to page 19 of that uh, document, it gives you the micro, the macro fiscal framework 2022 to 2025. And what will shock you there is the last two figures, the exponential growth of public debt from 2021 to 2025. So it starts off with a figure for 2021 of $1.8 trillion. It gets to about 10.3 trillion. I like to think these are Zimbabwean dollars. Then it gets to 2023, 17.3 trillion dollars. It gets to 2024, 22.5 trillion dollars. It gets to 2025, 31.8 trillion dollars. The percentage uh, of the debt as a percentage of GDP is expressed as in 2021 as 56.9, in 2022, 98.9, uh, in 2023, uh, 92.5, in 2024, 75.7. In 2025, 74.9. So you ask yourself, why is there an exponential increase in the debt that is now being disclosed by this a budget strategy paper when normatively and theoretically the debt is constant and the debt consists of areas that have already been uh, accumulated the, world, the Paris Club of Lenders, we accumulated that debt by 1999. So to the World Bank, so to the African Development Bank, and so forth. So what this figure then discloses is that this government has actually contracted debt right now and is in the process of contracting debt. Some of it is coming from private uh, players, particularly shared characters uh, from the Middle East, from Southeast Asia. So what will simply happen in 2023, 2024, 2025, 2026 is the increased uh, disclosure uh, of those dates, particularly as they reach their amortization period, particularly as they reach their their uh, 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 maturity uh, periods. And from where I stand, and we've done calculations in parliament, we actually estimate that the actual total sovereign debt is actually 42 billion US dollars, and not the 13 billion US dollars that has been disclosed uh, by the Minister uh, of uh, Finance. And a large part of that debt comes from uh, agreements we don't know around fuel involving interest in the Middle East, involving interest in uh, Southeast uh, Asia, the many contraction contracts that we are now executing in particular, just to give you one example, the construction of Bay Bridge Port Post or improvement thereof at a cost of US $200 million, which figure has not been disclosed uh, uh, in our books. Uh, up to uh, up to date. So in short, there is a great cost in monetary terms. There is a great cost in political uh, terms. Uh, we can quantify uh, the physical uh, 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 cost. There is a lot of non-disclosure, but I think citizens, including parliament, have a right to demand a full disclosure. The recent disclosure of food, uh, 2.7 billion US dollars uh, to the Chinese is shocking uh, because all of that had not been uh, disclosed. But there, there's another worrying thing. And the worrying thing is that 
a lot of this new debt now is now being securitized through our minerals. And you know, the minister uh, uh, disclosed that uh, 200 million US dollars that was borrowed in 2006 was secured by platinum. Uh, that is a volume of 26 million ounces. And as I pointed out in parliament, that's roughly around 52 billion US dollars. Even if you disagree with $2,000 and put a thousand dollars, that's still $26 billion. And there is no way you can collateralize a debt of $200 million by, by, uh, by assets that are worth billions and billions of dollars. I'm afraid to say that you have got a, a humongous amount of these debts that are actually being securitized uh, by the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. And one of the major creditors to Zimbabwe, which I've not mentioned to date, is the African Import and Export Bank, uh, Afrexim. Uh, there are varying disclosures of as to how much do we actually owe to the African Import and Export Bank, the African Exim Bank. So officially, the Reserve Bank will tell you that it's around 3.5 billion US dollars. In my respectful uh, position, the figure should actually be more than that. The figure should actually be around $5 billion. But this figure keeps on being rolled over uh, uh, as if there are new loans, yet there are no new loans. It's just old amounts whose interest rates are just being uh, capitalized. And their interest rates that are carrying the risk of Zimbabwe, their interest rates on the US dollar that are around 15 to 30% when the cost of international money right now is below uh, 3%. Uh, so the African Import Export Bank has really become a voucher fund uh, to Zimbabwe, uh, extracting not just quantitative huge amounts of, of, of loan interest, but also our minerals. The entirety of the Afro-Exim Bank loan of around $5 billion has actually been securitized through gold, uh, through uh, diamonds, and so forth. The Reserve Bank accepts this, but what the Reserve Bank has not placed before Parliament, is not placed before the people of Zimbabwe, is the extent of the securitization, the quantities of the securitization, the obligations of the securitization. Now, I don't support securitization. Securitization, even for those countries that have liquid assets that can easily be quantified, for instance, oil. The most common agreement you'll find that are securitized is oil, because the country can say, we are borrowing 2 billion US dollars. We are able to produce 200 million barrels of oil per year. We'll give you 100 million barrels per year. It's easier. It's more fungible. It's quantifiable. With our own minerals now that you have to extract, whether it's diamond, whether it's gold, whether it's platinum, whether it's chrome, it's actually dangerous. I submit that we don't have the expertise to do securitization. We also don't have the legal instrument to deal with a, a securitization. And in the absence of a legal instrument that authorizes the government of Zimbabwe and the Reserve Bank to actually use our, 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 our minerals as a security, I submit that it's illegal. But Zimbabwe is being ripped off as the Chinese example shows because we don't have the expertise quantitatively and, 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 and qualitatively of actually going through uh, the process of uh, securitization. And it must stop, and I hope Zimbabweans can find it within their means to confront the government and to hold the government so that they can stop uh, the unlawful securitization of our minerals. Another issue that concerns me, uh, Dr. Maconi, is the rise of domestic uh, debt. We know that up until 2019, the stock of domestic debt, because we're using US dollar, was a quantifiable figure of 12 billion US dollars. They cut that through the introduction of SI 33 of 2019, which converted all domestic debt to RRT GS dollars. But uh, the new, the, the midterm statement actually disclosed our domestic debt as of June 2022 is now standing at $1.3 trillion. And if you look at the budget strategy paper, and if you look at the, at the midterm review, uh, review at page 55, you see 
huge amounts of money that are being borrowed through treasury bills, through treasury uh, bonds. If you look as well at the 2021 audit statements by Mrs. Chiri for 2021, which were presented in June 2016, you also see Mrs. Chiri complaining about the overdraft facility that, that is still being maintained by the government of Zimbabwe, despite public protestations to the contrary with the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. So the government of Zimbabwe is still running an overdraft facility, which it has not disclosed recently with the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. And that comes out fully in Mrs. Chiri's uh, 2021 report presented in June 2022. So I submit that you are going to see massive increase in domestic uh, 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 debt. And this is where corruption comes in now. A lot of that domestic debt is being generated through as a result of uh, an overzealous uh, a fiscal uh, policy, the lack of fiscal uh, consolidation. In other words, a government that is uh, living beyond uh, its means, which brings me, uh, uh, which brings me to the disclosures by the Auditor General. We know that in, two, in 2017, the government deficit uh, or the government overdraft, which becomes a domestic debt, was 2.7 billion US dollars. In 2018, it was 3.5 billion US dollars. In 2019, it was 6.8 billion US dollars. We also know that even the, fig the figures disclosed by, by, we also know that even the figures disclosed by the Auditor General are an understatement. And we know this from two bureaus. We know this from the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Financial Adjustment uh, Bill of 2020, which disclosed that the government had spent around 10.6 billion US dollars between 2017 and 2019 outside parliament and was now seeking condonation uh, from parliament of that. We also know of this through the financial adjustment bill of 2022, where the government is now seeking condonation for 2020 and 21 of spending 103 a billion Zimbabwean dollars. What is the, the net effect of all this is that the figures are not credible. The net effect of this is that the, the tapes are continuing to run even though the books of accounts will officially have been closed. Now, I've said before that the 2021 books have been presented and have been audited by Mrs. Chiri. You will be shocked that the 2021 audited statements, which were presented in June of 2022, are a total fraud on the people of Zimbabwe. I suspect that the Auditor General did their work, but the, the, the system, in particular the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Finance simply excised uh, the true appropriation figures for the Ministry of Finance itself and for the rest of the government accounts. I know that there will be war in parliament uh, you know, over this. So there's no appropriation a statement for the Minister of Finance for 2020 and for 2021. Yet for the few safe votes that don't spend money, Ministry of Industry, uh, uh, Ministry of Labor and Social Services, the appropriation accounts for 2021 are disclosed. But for five key ministries, the Office of the Prime President, uh, the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Health, the Minister of Higher Education, and the Minister of Finance itself, the appropriation accounts are not uh, disclosed. So I suspect that for 2021, if for 2020, the, the overexpenditure, the budget deficit, which is part of domestic debt, was $6.8 billion, I suspect for 2021, it must be running in excess, uh, or, you know, in, ex in excess of uh, around seven billion US dollars, and they've cut that out because they are too embarrassed to disclose that. 
which is why the 2021 audited statements as it was publicized and as it stands is a fraud on the people of uh, Zimbabwe. And I hope friends, you can, you can go and read it and see the extent uh, of the of the of the of, of the of the fraud so to put it in summary you have two minutes let me you have two minutes yeah, yeah okay let me move very very quickly to corruption so corruption is generated through seven commanding heights of corruption the first one is the US dollar in the commodification of the US dollar and the operation of the Dutch auction system. Since it started, over 2 billion US dollars has been dished out to a very few people in the main, to not more than 15 main companies in the main, which include the, the INSCO group, Kudata Guire, and so forth. So the auction system and the US dollar is become an instrument of arbitrage in respect of which public resources are stolen through an artificial exchange rate, then distributed through a very opaque system. Second commanding height of corruption is of course fuel. We are spending around 2 billion US dollars on fuel. It's controlled by essentially two, three characters that include Stekunda, Puma, and, and, uh, and uh, 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 you know, the Russians, that is controlled by the retail outlets, Zuva. We all know who owns uh, uh, Zuva. Then uh, you, have got, uh, you have got Command Agriculture. Command Agriculture has been siphoning on average 2 billion US dollars to 4 billion US dollars uh, per year. That's a commanding height of, of, of corruption. And we also know uh, the beneficiaries then you have got agriculture and two, uh, one major crop in particular, tobacco. Tobacco is being smuggled out of Zimbabwe. The main culprit is a man called Simon Radland. At least a billion US dollars worth of tobacco is being smuggled out of Zimbabwe annually. Then you have got our commodities, in particular. Your time, say. Let me just summarize, in particular, uh, uh, in particular, I start off with diamonds. 25 billion US dollars was stolen. Read uh, the latest installment from Ed Cross. I never agree with him, but on this figure, I agree with him. Uh, you know that he has got a capacity to exaggerate, but on this one, he is not uh, exaggerating. So that's that's diamonds. Then you have got gold. A billion US dollars worth of gold is being smuggled out of Zimbabwe annually. 70% of the gold that is being processed at the Rand refinery right now, as I'm talking to you, is Zimbabwean gold. The gold coins are just being minted ostensibly to deal with inflation, but in reality, as a means of further looting, asset stripping, and externalization of Zimbabwe's, of Zimbabwe's wealth. Then you have got a contract, a pre-procurement. So in short, let me conclude by saying that is that uh, the true cost of corruption can normatively be quantified. Uh, the figures of debt, I've, I've tried to give you the figures of debt, the figures of uh, uh, the, the, the commanding heights of corruption, I can quantify them. But the true cost of debt and corruption in Zimbabwe is the extent of Zimbabwe's underdevelopment. The fact that uh, 76% of our people are living below the poverty datum line. The fact that 42 years after independence, 42% uh, of our people still use the bush uh, as a toilet. The extent of our roads, our dams, the lack of uh, development. So corruption and debt if, are being paid as a premium and at a great premium by the people of Zimbabwe through the sum totality of the Zimbabwean crisis, which includes underdevelopment. Some people talk of sanction. The real sanction in Zimbabwe is corruption, is the debt crisis, which arises out of mismanagement, is the poverty, the dying of our people that 42 years after independence, our people are dying of missiles and diarrhea. That's the real cost of corruption and debt. I thank you very, very much, Comrade Makoni. 
Thank you, Tendai. Uh, as usual, very lucid, uh, a number of very important uh, points he makes there. I will not preempt the discussion and particularly the discussions. It's my pleasure now to invite Janet Jo, uh, who has two approaches. She will make her own observations and is welcome to comment on the keynote presentation. Janet, your time, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Makwani, and uh, thank you, Advocate uh, Tendai Biti, for that uh, submission that you have made, which I uh, definitely cannot air and concur uh, on a number of issues, particularly uh, the current debt uh, for Zimbabwe, both uh, the domestic and the foreign debt. Uh, but just to emphasize that this conversation in terms of uh, the debt crisis and distress and what it has done to our economy uh, is undisputable. But um, I think our conversation for a long time when it comes to the issue of debt has been um, elevated or left at the level of um, the financial aspect uh, and very uh, technical aspects in terms of what we all, the areas, the figures, um, but we we have not really tried to, to put the human face uh, to the debt question or to understand the political economy of debt uh, like we are doing now. And uh, thank you very much, Sapis, that we're having this conversation because when we look at it then uh, and the way we are living, our living standards, um, the issue of extreme poverty, the issue of inequalities, it explains the political economy uh, of debt in terms of those that are benefiting uh, from the situation, those that are benefiting even from the debt itself. Uh, when you look, for example, at um, with the domestic debt and the drivers of domestic debt uh, currently in Zimbabwe, uh, when it comes to the inflated figures because of projects that the government is um, is implementing, uh, when you look as well from the external point of view uh, of debt, uh, when you look at um, our our current creditors as it stands, and uh, how the issue of securitization or how they are playing a big role around the resource backed loans and why we are getting uh, the minister giving us figures, for example, from China in terms of what we owe and what we are giving away uh, in terms of um, our natural resources and our, 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 um, um, our, our wealth, so to speak, that we are not even uh, really uh, sure of in terms of um, how much of the mineral resources uh, or our, our extractives are we, are we giving away. So there's a lot of extractivism and I totally agree uh, with, um, with with the advocates uh, there. Uh, but just to highlight as well that I think parts of, in, when we look at this uh, public debt and the drivers since independence or actually uh, the early 1990s uh, with the implementation of uh, ESAP has also been the issue of debt guarantees. And the de public debt guarantees have uh, made our debts to really increase uh, exponentially just recently, I think in 2021, we saw, for example, the CBZ agro yields for the winter wheat. Um, the government guaranteed that it will pay uh, CBZ agro yields for, for, for the farmers that uh, participated in the winter wheat program. And it was an open check uh, just for, for your own information. It did not have figures in terms of exactly how much the government is guaranteeing or is going to assume just in case uh, those farmers who were participating in the winter wheat uh, program uh, way, if they failed to, to pay. So, so those are some of those um, drivers that you would see that there is, um, you know, uh, creation of gaps uh, and loopholes that in the end uh, are causing our debts to, to increase um, exponentially or, or at the levels that, that they are now. So it also ties into the debt assumptions and will always be haunted. I think one of the biggest ones that we have spoken about and fought uh, from the Zim code perspective was the RBZ data assumption of 2015 of 1.2, uh, close to 1.3 billion of the farm mechanization program, where beneficiaries were very clear, there was a list, uh, but the government 
made use or arm twisted parliament because of the parliamentary politics that currently exist uh, or that have existed for, for, for a long time now to assume uh, that kind of date. And for a number of years, we have continued to see assumption of those dates. And some of them, they come from these, um, the, the adoption uh, where the executive is calling on the government or on the parliament, for example, to uh, approve the financial adjustment bills over expenditures uh, that are not supposed to be, if you look at our constitution, if you look at our public finance management act as an example. So in the end, we are, we, we continue to, to assume dates, but there's a big question that is being asked we have all this debt, the huge debt burden that we have, but where is the resource going? Where has it gone to? Because we haven't seen the material changes in terms of people's livelihoods, living standards, social security uh, and the like. Then there is also a, a big issue, I think, around the drivers of public debt and linked as well to corruption is the issue of unsustainable tax incentives. Um, so we have seen unsustainable and even harmful uh, tax incentives uh, to which when we look at it from the corruption perspective and the ballooning of the public debt, our government is giving unsustainable, harmful, arbitrary tax incentives, mainly to uh, mining companies. If you look especially for, from, for our investors um, from the East, we have one that uh, became very topical around the Great Dyke Investments as an example in the platinum. And um, that that is um leaving the consolidated revenue fund if you look at it from another angle without parliamentary approval of which parliament is the one that is responsible for the consolidated um revenue fund as an example so we continue to take away government revenue what should be government revenue uh we are giving it in tax in tax incentives and in the end we're securitizing and our public debt continues to grow and if you look at it it all it, it is as well linked to the issue of there'll be ventures so they they, they are ventures um the joint ventures there'll be a local company of some level and names have been said and they will continue to 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 be thrown in if you look at reports of cartels the century reports and the like so you see that the companies that get these tax incentives uh they are participating in the in the um, shadow economy in the deep state that we are talking about uh in the economy of affection that we have seen the nepotism uh the whole politically exposed persons that continue to benefit from this through the joint ventures uh that we we, we are seeing and the government um as well uh the executive has continued to ride on the weak regulator and institutional frameworks to arrest corruption but to also uh promote debt transparency the figures will continue to be thrown we agree on the on the on the um, um, official debt figures that we are being given but if you dig deeper definitely we can get to over 40 billion or 30 billion um dollars with united states dollars when we look at our at, at our debts but it is really overriding on the weak uh regulatory institutional frameworks that we have from the parliamentary level to the anti-corruption commission um to our public debt management which is not autonomous which we have called uh for a number of years uh, for it to be autonomous, for it to play its role and ensure that there is debt transparency, that there is debt audit, and we exactly know how much we owe um, in terms of harmonizing all our figures, our creditors, uh, and the debt that uh, that we owe, including the investments, the kind of investments that we are getting, and whether they are not actually loans and debts, and we are getting into contracts that continue um, to bind us when it comes to dealing with the debt question. Then there is, of course, the issue of um, fiscal indiscipline, and this indiscipline is uh, fueled mainly uh, by the appetite, actually, for grand corruption and systemic corruption. So, so we continue. We, 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 it's, it, it is really to pay, you know, those that are playing a role uh, within the political sphere, within the political economy. When we look at the struggles that we have for the elites, for those we have, for those who are benefiting from uh, from corruption, so they continue actually um, to then benefit. And the fiscal indiscipline. I think we can also go to the issue around uh, the quasi fiscal activities by the Arab BZ, uh, public institutions and parastatals borrowing as well. Uh, then the government guarantees uh, or assumes. Uh, the dates uh, at, at, at some level. Uh, I will not speak much to, to the issue of resource-backed loans, which is a big issue when it comes to the natural resource rents uh, that we that we continue to pay and um, 
and, and, and the big question around it in terms of at the end of the day, what kind of legal um, or, or debt legacy uh, are, we, are, we, are we leaving uh, for, for the next generation? But there are many scandals um, that we have witnessed uh, within the parastatals, within government institutions from the power, Zisco, Zimbabwe, National Railways, housing scandals, Z-therapy, the war victims compensation scandal, GMB, they continue to come. So we, we tracked, I tried to track this and I came, uh, I, I think I went as far back as 1987 uh, to the current in terms of scandals and how much we have lost uh, out of uh, various uh, sectors, uh, but mainly in the infrastructure, mainly um, in the national railways in Zimbabwe, um, talk about roads, uh, talk about command agriculture, uh, water, rural development, Chinese tender scandals, um, DRC timber and diamond, unreported scandals that we have um, we have um, heard of or that have actually uh, been brought forward, including as well for local authorities as well, and the government or the central government playing a key role within those. But what 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 is what Three is the community? Minutes, Okay, uh, Dr. Um, I think, thank you. What thank is you. worrying is the, is the impunity, I think, um, around uh, all the debts, uh, the public debts that, that we have. And uh, maybe in my three minutes, it's just to highlight some of the examples in terms of then how we pay as citizens, I think, which is what is important uh, so that we politicize the, the whole conversation of debt, which, which I think is what we need to do is the political question to this debt. So if you look at the impact, I just wanted to give you an example of how it's undermining social pro protection spending as an example. And I went through uh, the past five years where we have failed to meet, for example, the 4.5 African social policy uh, commitment. Um, from 2017, we only covered the social protection 0.50, 2018 0.77, 2019 uh, 0.73, we are way, way below. In 2022, we only gave 2.10% uh, to social protection, even though we have climate change issues, the disasters that we have uh, experienced, including the COVID-19, which definitely needs, you know, a stimulus package for industry, uh, but for the social protection as well as many livelihoods were actually decimated given our how informal our economy is, unemployment is, the education sector, the health sector, and the like. Then we look at children as well as an example in malnutrition. 4.4 million children in Zimbabwe are facing um, acute Janet, have we lost malnutrition? 3.5, you have lost me um, as an example. I hope you can hear me now. Um, in the health yes, sector, yeah. poor emergency health, health systems as well, like of basic things like ambulances, uh, is an example. Beam project, be, the beam assistance, for example, in education, 4.5 million children need beam assistance. Poor public service delivery. So, so, so the whole public data and corruption it manifests in poor public uh, public services. Uh, it has uh, manifested in 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 you in. People losing their lives uh, of basic or, or, or diseases that could easily um, be dealt with. We have uh, we actually uh, failed to 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 deal with those. So I think we need to rethink through in terms of how do we. Um, call on, on, on the government saying, uh, advocate, uh, BT spoke about uh, the sanctions. Is way. if you look at those they have imposed restrictions or sanctions on Zimbabwe, then it's half a minute that we need to do with. It's the key in political reform issue. Uh, calls for intuition. Janet, switch off your, your video. Janet. Yeah. Thank you very much. Janet, we've lost you.
conversation that we have to continue to end. Yeah, I think my network is not stable, but I think I'll end here. I'll come, I'll come in uh, at some point, uh, Dr. Makon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. I'm sorry that technology failed us towards the end, but uh, we, we got the gist of your submission there, very sharp and pointed. Uh, my pleasure now to invite Chennai, your 15 minutes of your own thoughts and any critique of what uh, Tendai said. Chennai, thank you. Thank you, um, Dr. Makoni. So I think I can only but um, concur with both prior submissions, uh, very accurate and concise in terms of what is happening with the debt question in Zimbabwe. The only thing I would perhaps try to um, add on, as it were, and to explain, is the, the extent to which the government of the day has such a perverse relationship with debt. And, and I think this is, a, if anybody takes anything away, it's, it's that point that says that anytime you see, you hear the, the, the current government speaking about, we've been given this loan, we have done this, right? understand that the relationship that they have with debt is indeed perverse. And I will focus on potentially two examples, if time allows, on, on, on why I'm saying this. And, um, you know, at the moment, I'm sure some of the participants, some of the people here on the line or wherever are sitting in the dark. There's no electricity. We had a recent, I think, was it yesterday? Um, something in the media saying that Zimbabwe is now actually producing less, almost less than a third of what we require in terms of energy. But at the same time, we see this relationship of debt accumulating. So we've got a, an accumulating uh, debt ledger, but a reducing productivity and, and progression. So what is happening? How are we increasing our debts? But at the same time, productivity is reducing. Why do we have that inverse relationship between debt accumulation and uh, productivity? And the answer to that, simply put, is corruption. And a good case in point to explain that is the situation in Wange. We have seen the debts, we have heard of the debts that are associated with Wange Colliery, with the Wange Thermal Power Plant. And yet, if you were to go back um, to the early 80s or even before, we were actually doing more for the community through Wange Colliery than we are doing now. And yet, we have borrowed so much more. So what actually is happening? Wange Colliery, as we know, is actually privately listed, but the government will own 42%. And it is this 42% ownership that has been used to increase the country's indebtedness at the expense of, develop, of the development that Janet has spoken about, at the expense of progress and poverty reduction. The government would prefer to go into debt than to actually start trading. And you ask yourself, why is that? If, if we own 42%, Wange Colliery is actually listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange market, but it doesn't trade. We would rather go and, um, and borrow um, using the public purse as well. So we are not borrowing on the private entity, we are borrowing on, the, on, pub, on public debt and extending our public debt. Um, you look at Wange Colliery, I think um, I read an article that said, going back to the 80s and before, you know, we were employing 5,000 people, we supported the community, it was the bedrock of the community, more than 100,000 people relying on Wange Colliery at the time. And you bring it to today, where we actually have had access to further capital financing through debt, but we're employing less than half the people. And we are barely servicing the community and barely producing what we should be if you were to align the, the capital financing that has gone in vis-a-vis -vis the productive, productiveness. Um, in August of 2022, the Sunday Mail reported that um, Wange Colliery had been put under construction by, by Minister Ziambi Ziambi. And I think this was actually a cop out following the, if you look at the um, Audit General's um, report and what actually happened under Minister Winston Titando, you will find that going into management construction was actually a get out of jail card for us not to continue to investigate what has happened to 160 million? How can we say 
we had 160 million that was invested in, into this, but nothing came out of it. Instead, we are now in a position where the company is, is on its knees and has to go under construction. Looking into the uh, public domain, and I encourage anyone who is listening to do the same, because this is simply what I've done. Go and look at Wange Colliery and look at how much has been given in Chinese loans that we've had. I mean, we had a session um, earlier in the year, I think, on Chinese debt. So I won't um, revisit some of those points. But how much did we actually borrow? And where are we now? 2016, we know that there were Chinese loans outstanding to Wange Colliery, which, were, which actually resulted in mining equipment from the colliery being put onto auction to recover some of the loans that we had received from John Jing Company, which was meant to um, facilitate the purchase of equipment. I think we were owing about $20 million in, US in 2016. In 2012, we had a credit um, line, again, for equipment, uh, $22 million US dollars from a Chinese company uh, or Chinese institution. In 2012, there were conversations with the South Africa Development Bank to borrow 100 million US dollars. I'm not sure how much was eventually disbursed, but you know, we were speaking something in the, to the tune of 100 million US dollars. The Audit General Report in 2016 highlighted that there was an amount of 111 million from Wange Colliery that had been subjected to mismanagement, reckless trading, under the, um, the supervision and watch of the, of the then Minister Winston Chitando. And um, which included, um, I think the minister was mentioned that we had bulk coal that was being taken, um, being taken to go to under unclear circumstances. There were bribery charges, um, you know, uh, we were paying for equipment worth $800,000, we would pay $2 million and so on and so forth. So when you look at the relatedness between debt, corruption and productivity, you can see that as we are increasing in debt, we are then increasing in corrupt activity. And that is why we are where we are in the way of our productiveness. And as, as, as was highlighted earlier, what would then result in increased poverty, et cetera. We look at the Wange Thermal Power Plant. You know, we had a Chinese Exim Bank alone 1.2 billion, I think in 2014, for refurbishment of the Wange Thermal Power Plant to increase us to 600 megawatts. But what happened next? It stalled in 2016, apparently we hadn't paid or serviced a, a debt to sign a show which also included um, works for the Wange Thermal Plant. I think that was about 77.2 million. So that stalled development because they wouldn't carry on um, with, uh, with development of the thermal power point until we had serviced that debt. How did we service that debt? We had another loan for, for the DECA, uh, for the DECA um, station. And we used the amount of that loan to pay off some of the loan for the Wange Colliery. Um, we know in 2016, as I've said, we covered this before um, on this platform in terms of the Chinese um, Zimbabwe bilateral relationships, which went a bit sour in 2016, which resulted in that 1.2 billion that had been promised not being um, disbursed, which again, once again, stalled the project, which was the Wange Thermal Power, Point, uh, power Plant, only to be restarted again in 2018 with the contract um, allocated to Sino Hydro to deliver the, the thermal power plant. We know that to date, we continue to service this debt using loans that have been sourced for other projects that has then resulted in those projects being delayed, such as the Deca Thermal Power Point, because even though we have discussed uh, prior about um, the China Exim Bank being part concessionary, part non-concessionary. Therefore, we have to pay because, you know, otherwise we, we do have the issue on equipment, which would come under auction if we continue not to, to service the debt. Um, we currently, so what, what then happens at the moment, we are apparently, I think the latest uh, media report from the Herald said that we were potentially 82% towards completion of Wange Thermal Power Point. Since 2014, we are incurring interest on a, on a loan. We are incurring, um, you know, all these things 
people have been retrenched and so on and so forth. And we are 82% there. We still haven't delivered. So we've got this, as I say, this um, very perverse relationship between the debt that we are accumulating and what it is actually achieving. We, I've, I've mentioned before in terms of the, um, even the payback period, you know, you look at the DECA pipeline project, right? We sourced that loan again in 2013, 29 million US dollars from the India Exim Bank. We did not start this project until maybe 2019, but even up to now, we don't, I think 2021, we disbursed, we eventually disbursed 3.9 million to start to initiate the project, a project that we sourced the funds in 2013. And what then also happens is we got this money from the Indian Exim Bank. They then insist to us who should contract out of India to deliver that. And by the time we were ready to do it, I think um, the India Exim Bank put forward a contractor, uh, Mahindra, I believe they are the ones potentially um, um, delivering the Deca Pipeline project. And when they were brought on, they said, actually, you need more money. So they said your 29 million will not be enough. What is actually needed is 48.1 million US dollars. So what do we do? We, we get some more money from India Exim Bank. Of course, they'll give us more money because we are paying that money back to them via the contractor that they choose. And whilst that is happening, nothing is, is, has been delivered. Between 2013 and 2022, I was laughing at a headline in, 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 um, in the Sunday Mail, July 2022, it says, Deca project takes shape. From 2013, it's now taking shape. We are now, now 48.1 million in debt and we are taking shape in July, 2022. What has happened? What have we, why did we not look at the payback period in 2013? Why are we in a borrowing on projects that we are not yet ready to initiate? And what is happening in terms of the interest? Why are we assigning- Three um, minutes, a, Shanae. Okay, a contractor that- um, Three minutes. Is, Sure, that is assigned by, um, by the lender. So you see that the, the relationship that Zimbabwe currently has in terms of borrowing, six less of actually delivering and producing results for the people of Zimbabwe. Rather, we have um, this propensity to borrow for self-interest, propensity to borrow for corrupt practices, pro propensity to borrow for anything other than actually um, delivering development to the people of Zimbabwe. So I, I do encourage other, other folk to, to continue to look even at these, continue to track the three projects, the Thermal Power Point, the Deca Pipeline Project, and Wange Colliery. And you will find that as much as our debt stock is increasing, we cannot stay the same for productivity. Um, so I think I'll end there, Dr. Makwani, thank you. Thank you very much, Chennai. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, Tendai. Uh, very fertile exchange. Um, a number of very key issues that arise, which I hope our discussion can capture appropriately. From accountability and responsibility to the citizens, to the people of Zimbabwe. The dichotomy between domestic and foreign debt, the vexing question of the quantum of the debt, how much exactly do we owe who for what? And what have we used all these borrowings for? How do they touch the lives of the people of Zimbabwe? Securitization, a very technical, but also broadly uh, human welfare issue, also robbing the future. How do we commit so many billions to secure 200 million whose impact on the lives of the people 
can barely be seen anywhere. The, the lack of discipline and the impunity we spend, and then we come to the people's representatives and say, please condone. What arrogance. The discussion is not about the technical or the financial issues, but about the political economy and the impact, the human effect of the debt. A very important facet, which could by itself constitute a whole discussion point around guarantees to private sector. How much of this huge debt we are carrying has been used to secure private companies who will declare profits and dividends whilst we, the poor, remain poor or even get poor. So some of the key issues that emerge. There was a lot of reference in all three uh, presentations about the relationship with our all weather friends, as they are called. What exactly do we owe them? For what? And how have we benefited from it? What of our future have we mortgaged to our all weather friends? That again could be the subject of a freestanding dialogue or two even. So as we come into the discussion, I invite you colleagues, uh, sh sharp, precise, two minutes, a comment, a question, but not a new presentation. Uh, you are able to indicate to me if you want the floor by raising your hand on the screen and I will come to you. So I am at your pleasure and at your service in the discussion, who wants to kick off first? You can activate your microphone if you're not able to raise your hand for me to see you. I cannot believe that we do not have a view on such a profound subject as we have been dished by our three presenters. Dr. Makwani, I can see some what questions in the chat. Oh, there are questions being posed on the chat. Would, would, would those posing questions on the chat please vocalize them in case we are not all following the chats? Simbi Soranga, you asking about commonizing the costs and privatizing the profits. Yes, uh, Gamu. Hi, uh, Dr. Makoni. Can I go ahead? This is Simbifranga. Yes, please, Gamu. You have the floor. OK, thank you. Uh, it, it's just a, a, a comment that we. it seems like those in the government, they are busy securitizing our minerals and other resources, and they are pocketing the money from that uh, while the country is going deeper and deeper into poverty. Uh, so my question was actually to uh, uh, advocate and IBT, like how can we, the citizens of Zimbabwe, stop this plundering now, not in 2023 or the next election? Question number one. Question number two, a new government coming in, what can be done to make sure that we reverse these wrongs? Thank you. Thank you very much. I will ask the presenters to please take note and then I will create time for a response before we wind down. I see the hand of Tony Rila. Hello. Tony, you have the floor. I'm um, sorry, um, if I could just jump in. Um, you mentioned that I should speak before Simbi so, um spoke. Uh, my name is Gamchira Mbetu. I appreciated the discussion um, and there was some rhetoric about the citizens holding the government to account. I'm just curious if there are any ideas on um, accountability mechanisms that the citizenry can use. We are aware of the different parliamentary committee hearings, but I understand they are quite mm -hmm. under attended 
And also what movements are there to educate people so that they are financially literate to scrutinize um, this, this government spending and the public finance uh, financing so that they can actually comment and hold the government to account. Thank you, Gamu. Uh, Tendai, what can the people do? Tony, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And thank you to the presenters for an uh, extremely disturbing presentation between all three of them. My question is simple. I think all of them have pointed out the opacity of uh, uh, the, uh, the debt that we don't know what the extent of it is, or we might know what the extent of it is, but it's extremely difficult. And then they've made the links to corruption. So my question is very simple. Where did the money go and how do we get it back? Because when Tendai Biti and there's no demure from the others, says 42 billion plus has disappeared. This is a very large amount of money that we the citizens have lost. Where did the money go and how do we get it back? Thank you, Tony. Uh... I don't know if it's Mr. or Miss or Mrs. Macheka, but you have the floor. Please go ahead, Macheka. Maybe he doesn't okay. hear me. Macheka, can you hear me? Oh, uh, please comment. go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. Mine is just like a, a comment. Um, like, uh, why can't we initiate the law, although the parliament is controlled by the ruling party, but probably maybe it can, whereby we can put stiffer sentences for these criminals, for these uh, criminals, like the death sentence, we bring the death sentence. I know that the death sentence is uh, unconstitutional subject to the constitution of Zimbabwe. But uh, if we can advocate for the death sentence for those people who are corrupt, because by corruption, this through corruption, these people are making a lot of people to die. So secondly, I'm advocating that all institutions which lend money to Zimbabwe, we can try to approach them and um, inform them that they must stop to lend us money because the money is not being used for the public. It's going to the personal po pockets of Taguire and his team. So my two proposition is to come out with a law, which is like the death sentence for these criminals who are stealing from the public coffers. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, stiffer penalties for the offenders and lobby the lenders to stop lending. I see Tendai's hand is up. Uh, not Tendai BT, Tendai the other one. Please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Um, I guess my, my, I just have a quick question um, regarding all the other institutions that are uh, giving financing to Zimbabwe. Are there no stipulations that they can set? Uh, Tendai, you're muted. Tendai, we've lost you. Could you please unmute yourself? OK, can you hear me now? Yes, yes you're back. Thank you. Oh, awesome. So I was saying other institutions that are loaning Zimbabwe money, just basically, um, which don't seem so as corrupt or having that much self-interest, why are there no um, stipulations that if we are going to deal with other lenders who seem to be pillaging our country, then they will not give us any loan facilities? Why is there no hard stand against such... Um, you know, su such clear uh, witchcraft. 
why are there no rules against that coming from other financing organizations? Thank you. That's that's my own question. Thank okay. You. Why are other institutions allowing this to happen? Thank you. Um, I don't see any other hand up. I'm happy to invite any one of the three if you would like to engage the comments and questions that have been posed. And when I notice another hand, I will invite them to contribute. Um, Janet. Do you want to venture into what can we do and can we impose stiffer penalties? Uh, Chennai, I see your hand. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. So on the issue uh, of... You have the floor. Yeah, so on the issue of um, can we impose stiffer penalties? So. And this is where it's it's um it's our relationship with with the, with international um institutions whereby there are some better lenders that that we can no longer borrow from because we are so indebted, and so their stance in almost helping us has been well we're not going to lend you anymore, but what that that has done is it has then opened us up to institutions like the China the Chinese banks the India Exim Bank, the Afro Exim Bank that um, Honorable Viti mentioned, that um, are not as um, scrupulous, you know, they will lend, and, and, and I've seen articles in Zambia who, since their change of government, have been trying to also look at their debt question, and they've actually highlighted the issue of reckless lending. So when we are being um, given this money, it's not necessarily designed to assist us, it's not a form of help. So the government will, you know, they will in, have a, a whole kind of media propaganda on, yes, we've been given all this money, but really this money is not out there to help us. As I've tried to, in, to introduce the multiplier effect of getting a loan from India and repaying an Indian um, organization with that loan and then still having to pay interest as well on that loan, it creates this debt entrapment that is not really designed to get us out of debt, but rather to keep us there and to keep us, um, I think we talked about um, domestic debt trap, that it is through the debt that we are then trapped into other bilateral agreements um, with these countries just because we owe them so much. So to look to them to say, well, can you borrow, can you lend us responsibly? That is not in their best sovereign interest. To them, they're looking at opportunities of extending their own um, capital investments, whether it's through interest, through recontracting and all this. So it is not in their best interest. Um, alternatively, like I've tried to mention as well, the, the government of the day is not so much keen, well, even if they are keen, they are not really, um, they don't have access to private sector investment because of everything else. And this is where, again, the political question comes into play. We do not have access to private sector financing because we do not respect human rights, we do not uh, respect property rights and so on and so forth. So I know somebody mentioned, well, what will happen if there's a change in government? We have all these debts. In the first instance, it does mean that we can start to relook at our financing and restructure our financing. And because if you are in a situation where you are upholding human rights, you're upholding um, property rights and so on and so forth, you can get access to private sector financing, which will move uh, uh, the country away from this um, reliance on, on, on debt that is not really designed um, to assist us. In terms of um, the, the citizens, um, you know, we, we, I have in the past called for to say, could we please at least at the very least have a public um, a debt audit because I applaud, uh, you know, um, uh, when Honorable Tendai Biti was saying that in, they have tried to actually calculate how much we owe as a country because this is not publicly available. We had, we've had so much, you know, you just have to pick it up in dribs and, dribs and drabs. The Minister of Finance, he avoids saying if you read the public debt statement, it is not clear precisely how much do we owe and to whom and what is the total and what have we done with the money. And so in the first instance, I would say there must be some sort of citizens, um, if possible, class act to actually force 
that transparency to force to say we want to know what is our public debt audit and we want it now you know because that i think um, i've said through other conversations with janet and kind of the zim court who have talked about us taking 94 years or something like this before we can repay our existing debt ledger so that is something that we as as a citizenry we must push and, and require and absolutely ask for a public debt audit so we are clear in the very least as to what we owe and to whom we owe it and whether there's any resources assigned because that is the other thing that we are seeing recently the traffic gura um, uh, uh, outstanding debt which is being repaid through nickel and other mining um outputs thank you, you know Chennai. so yeah i'll leave it there thank you um J janet in half a minute would you like to comment on the idea of class action for an audit in terms of feasibility and can it be done at law uh thank you thank you dr Makon. i think um we we do have our rights in terms of um holding the the, the government uh, accountable and um, it is us who are suffering or bearing the brunt uh, of these public debt that we are talking about. And um, it is really well within uh, what we have to be doing when we are practicing our citizenship. We have to hold accountable and the issue of social accountability is critical. And uh, when we are talking about this and trying to find ways in terms of dealing with our debt, um, I think the issue of responsible borrowing and responsible lending is one that we must drive as citizens. So, so this uh, comes to the to what we put uh, on the table for the creditors themselves, and um, it it is not an easy one. Of course, now that the multilateral institutions that are a bit more transparent in terms of uh, what they will be lending are not lending to us. So we are depending on private credit creditors mainly and our bilateral creditors um, from, 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 from the East. So, so that gives us um, a different um, ball game altogether. But I think there still is uh, opportunity because some of these dates, especially assumptions, the guarantees that we have seen, we still have institutions that we have to hold accountable. And I think as citizens, um, we should be able to do that. And um, we are talking, for example, about uh, resource-backed loans. We are talking about tenders, um, that the, the tenderpreneurships uh, that we, we have seen. And I believe that um, as citizens, we still have scope to hold, um, you know, either our parliamentarians, um, our government uh, accountable. I know that mobilizing an extremely poor um, population is difficult, but I think we need to continue to build the voice and the movement, uh, the debt justice movement, and push for a debt audit, uh, push for, you know, end to the resource-based loans that we have seen, tender auditing as an example, strengthening of our watchdog institutions and working with them. And I think we have champions that we can work with in terms of um, the legal framework that you're talking about as well. In parliament, as a, for, for example, I think we do have champions uh, that we can make use of and uh, work with as the citizens. And I think there are possibilities. It's only that we have to deal with how do we deal with the fear that we have. But I think there are legal ways in terms of how to deal with this in raising our voices uh, as citizens that are nonviolent, that are legal, that are well within uh, our rights in the legal ambit uh, to ensure that we, we, we call um, for institutions that work and that will address uh, this, that, this issue as well. I think, for example, we, we pay, there's so many taxes that we are paying. Why? Because government is actually foregoing revenue, for example, through the tax incentives that we're talking about, through corruption and the like. But what do we do as citizens? Because the, city, the, the, the taxes continue to come on us. They may be 2% tax. They are with holding tax, various tax, tax um, the, the taxes that, that, that we are being levied. What do we do and how do we build our movement based on um, the impact of corruption that, that, that we are facing and we start moving and holding accountable. Some of them, we know the names. And uh, there was one time when the Century Report came out, we actually came up with different action plans that we had said, how do we boycott um, Tagire's empire? in terms of where we're getting um, uh, fuel, it could be uh, or roads or, or the like, how do we deal with all those? And I think there are legal ways in which we can do that, um, Dr. Makwan. 
Thank you very much. Uh, useful uh, lines of thought. Uh, two avenues that would warrant further examination uh, in terms of borrowing from private entities. And uh, one of the presenters pointed to a person in the Middle East who is lending big time. And then private sector guaranteed debt, which basically means the people are being burdened by borrowings that are benefiting private entities. Among the many avenues that also open up opportunities for corruption, those two stand out for further scrutiny. Tendai, do you want to uh, share any reflections in the discussion at this stage? Uh, yes, Tok. Are you here? Yes, Tok. Thank you. Can you hear me? I can indeed, and I can see you too. Thank you very much for showing yourself to us. I agree. First, uh, Dr. Mandaza demanded that uh, I expose my ugly face. So two things. I think the first one is that um, any new government must clearly have a, an audit of um, uh, all the agreements, uh, all the debts that has been contracted to date uh, from a legal point of view, a moral point of view, a value for money uh, a, a point of view. Uh, I don't think that we have sufficient expertise in the country to do a comprehensive uh, debt. So it will require a lot of work, a lot of uh, international uh, assistance with our friends in, on the African uh, continent. Uh, but that is simply is imperative. That has been done by other African countries, including the Democratic Republic of Congo and so forth. And it's now understood and accepted that for resource-rich countries of which Zimbabwe falls into that category, it's, it's a normal and accepted uh, uh, practice. The second thing that I want to mention is that um, we have spoken about uh, corruption restricted to domestic cartels, restricted to the government, uh, and so forth. But one of the things that we did not uh, discuss is the issue of illicit financial uh, flows. Uh, between uh, 2009 and 2012, Zimbabwe lost 3 billion US dollars to in the form of illicit uh, 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 you know, financial flows through uh, transfer pricing, uh, thin capitalization, uh, 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 under invoicing, over invoicing, uh, and, and, and so forth. And that is still happening uh, to the present uh, day. And illicit financial flows is largely the domain, uh, the playground of the big players, uh, uh, you, you know, you know your, your, the BATs of this world, the Zimplats of this world. Uh, platinum is a major source and driver uh, of illicit uh, financial flows. As all of you know, uh, we don't have a platinum refinery in Zimbabwe. And, uh, and, and when a ton of platinum is taken out of Zimbabwe to go to South Africa for refining, there are potentially six uh, PMGs that are mined from the same ore. This includes gold, it includes silver, mm -hmm. it includes uh, rhodium, it includes uh, nickel, and so forth. And these are extremely rich resources. When the same characters then account to Zimbabwe, they only account for one mineral, uh, namely the platinum. So illicit financial flows are a major uh, a, a concern. Third is what uh, Janet uh, uh, spoke of, which is the corruption that is uh, you know, arising out of uh, the huge tax exemptions, uh, tax reliefs, and tax windows that are being given particularly to players in the mining uh, 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 sector. And it's a pity that uh, this, is a, this is a subject that is so understudied in Zimbabwe. Uh, in, across the rest of Africa, in particular in Kenya, they've got what is called the Tax Justice uh, Network that have done fantastic work in unpacking uh, the opportunity cost, the price, the premium uh, of uh, uh, is the, uh, of the burden that countries are carrying uh, as a result of um, 
uh, 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 the exemptions, the tax exemptions uh, that are being given to these countries. Lastly, let me let me just talk about uh, the Chinese. Chennai spoke about the 1.2 billion uh, contract for the construction uh, of a thermal unit of about 600 megawatts in seven and eight. Now, the cost of constructing a megawatt is generally known. So 2,000 megawatts is equal to about 2 billion US dollars. And Dr. Makoni, you know this, because I know you were trying to do the Batoka with the, with, with the Zambians. Uh, 2,000 megawatts from Batoka Gorge at a cost of uh, around 2 billion. So we are paying 1.2 billion for a mere 600 uh, megawatts. You can see the cost. So it should have been around $600 million. It's costing double. The same applied to Wange, Kariba South. In Kariba South, some of you will know that the Zimbabwean government contracted a contract of about $500 million to put two generators that will uh, stabilize the uh, output, uh, the 700 megawatts installed there of uh, hydropower. Uh, Zambians did the same on Kariba North using the same Kamban. But in Zimbabwe, the price was double. The price was double. Zambia, around $250 million. So we need a mechanism in respect of which our friends and their friends, uh, they supported us during the liberation struggle, can really appreciate that we are a poor, struggling a, a country that needs genuine help, not extraction. Some of the things that our friends are doing to us. If history was to be rewritten and you compare what is happening and what the pioneer column did and what uh, Cecil John Rhodes did, you'll be shocked by what our so-called friends uh, are, are doing. But I think they are taking advantage of our own caprices, our own weaknesses. Someone asked, we've borrowed 42 billion US dollars, but we have nothing to show for it. We have a lot to show for it. Look at the extent of our roads. Uh, with great respect to the Democratic Republic of Congo, we are the port war capital of, of, of Africa. There's been no gross capital formation in Zimbabwe. If you wake up someone who died in Zimbabwe in 1968, you won't get lost. I was in Muzarabani a few weeks ago. If Mbuyane and I were to wake up in Muzarabani on the old Mazoe River, she will not get lost. She would say, our friends, Let's go. So that's the cost of the under. <laughs> that's the cost of the under underdevelopment. If you want to see the cost of the underdevelopment, look at the mansions that they're extracting and excavating in Shawasha Hills, in Borodil, and, and, and so forth. They've got mansions with, with lifts and, and elevators. They are driving Lamborghinis, Ferraris, and so forth. Go to Semlevis village. If you close your eyes in one of the shops, you think you are in Dubai, you are in New York, you are in, you are in Milan, you are in Oxford Street, London. That is the cost of uh, the, the, you know, you know, the, the looting. Finally, one point I want to make, which I didn't make, a, 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 a Janet a kind of hinted on it. The debt assumptions which we have been taking over. She mentioned the, debt, the Reserve Bank debt assumption of 2015, two, two, uh, two, uh, sorry, 1.5 billion. The debt assumption of 20, December 2021, 3.5 billion. But there's another debt assumption. It is the debt assumption, Dr. McCord, of the parastate house, as if we are on stereos in the last mm. two years with us. Assume the debt for Cisco, the debt for Air Zimbabwe, Zinara, the debt for this. So what in fact we are doing is we are we are chlorinating corruption because these parastatals accumulate corruption. Take Air Zimbabwe, take GMB, take take Zesa, which then goes to the fiscals without accountability, without an audit, without an obligation and a duty to act. Uh, Janet and their friends are doing fantastic work at, uh, at, 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 at Zimcourt, but we need alliances across the board uh, to deal with these issues. 
And these are the real issues. These are the real issues that citizens uh, ought to be uh, confronted. Uh, us are poor, but we can't explain why we are poor. We think it's God's making. It's not God's making. It's Trafigura. It's Secunda. It's BAT. It's Zimblads. It's bad governance. It's abuse of the rule of law. That's why we are poor. So we need to check up. We need to look the beast in the eye. We need to not to blink. We need to be smart. We need to be researched. We need to be brave. I thank you very much, Dr. Makonise. Thank you, Tendai. It's a passionate plea. It's, it's got a very vivid pain that comes out. Um, I allow Tendai uh, latitude so that he combined his comment on the discussion as well as his own uh, winding up thoughts. I would like to ask Janet if you have any final words for us in a minute and a half. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Makoni. And um, I would just want to reiterate uh, the point around the debt justice movement, which is um, alliances that we have to build across the board. And uh, it's not only for Zimpod or for organizations that are working on economic justice, uh, but um, every citizen uh, he has got a role to play. Because if you look at our debt, even if we look at um, um, the current debt, if, in terms of the official figures that we've been given by the government, the public, uh, the domestic debt and the external debt, we are talking of um, close to about um, $17 billion. And if we divide that with our population to get the debt per capita, uh, with our 16 million people in Zimbabwe, it means each and every Zimbabwean is owing a huge um, chunk of, uh, of of that debt, and there is a way that we are paying it, paying that debt. So, so those alliances that um, uh, Honourable BT is talking to includes if you're in the health sector and your debt per capita is say two thousand dollars, what it means is that you have to pay it in one way or the other. So we we'll continue to repay the debts. We are doing it at a snail space. Uh, it will take us over 100 years for us to clear our debts uh, that we're talking about it, the rate that we are paying currently. So you pay through your health, you pay through for going your, your water provisions, you pay through having the roads that we have, not having a, a proper public um, transport system, we'll pay through various ways that, that, that we'll have to pay as citizens. So the building of allow alliances is something that we cannot uh, overemphasize. So we need to continue to educate ourselves uh, in terms of exactly what this debt uh, means for all of us, means for young girls, means for young boys, uh, what it means for women, what it means for people with disabilities that have to get social security uh, and social uh, um, uh, social support or protection from the government, what it means for tertiary uh, students in, in colleges and universities when they don't get grants, when they don't get um, government support for, for their education. So these are all uh, ways that we have to look at the political economy of debt and where we are sitting in terms of those that are fitting uh, and those that are actually uh, bearing the brand or have to pay the so it's just a call on the citizens uh, and from where a debt take on each and every uh, head of the Zimbabwean population that we have and even children that are yet to be born they are born into this uh, into this debt and we we, we need to to act uh, but the issue of resisting to pay in the debt relief that Tony I've seen that Tony has also put um, in the chat I think the issue of illegitimate and odious debts in Zimbabwe when we look at our current debt stock uh, is a key issue that we have to be raising mm -hmm. what did the the different wonders uh, or what that we have fought be it wonder I mean, how much did that, did that cost us? The Hondo in DRC, Gabe did, how much did that cost us in terms of repression, uh, in terms of human rights violation? And the big question is the moral and the legal issues around those dates. Dates are passing uh, through parliament. They're not being passed by parliament. So we are seeing data assumptions passed 
passing through parliament, you know, um, how are we going to deal with those? And I think we do have um, a cause and we do have a strong case for us to present when it comes to the debt relief to our creditors, uh, to our government of the day, or even the government that will come at any, any, any point in time. So the issue of the debt audit will be a big issue that we need to continue uh, to push for. But just to reiterate, as I conclude as well, Dr. Makoni, that um, we have sanctioned ourselves by continuing to borrow when we do not need to be borrowing. We are a rich country, we have resources, we are mortgaging them, we are giving tax incentives, then we borrow, then we levy the citizens, we tax heavily the citizens. And these are issues that we need to be talking about. We need to be producing, we need to be um, uh, putting our resource towards production, uh, but that is not what we are doing. We continue to line the pockets of only a few uh, that are politically exposed and the citizens. Th those are issues that we need to be grappling with and building our alliances to fight um, against uh, and, and, and to build once again our economy on human um, development on people-centered development and continuing to have these dialogues uh, amongst ourselves. Otherwise, we are going back to, and we are talking about emerging economies currently, but I think where we are taking Zimbabwe, if we just look at our roads, if you look at our infrastructure, we're taking it to a pre-emergent <laughs> economy. When at one point we're the breadbasket of Africa, we were shining the bright spot in terms of how things have to be done right. We have the human capital, we have everything uh, in place, but we need to uh, be thinking about how leadership, the leadership issue, I think when it comes to debt and corruption is the big issue we have to deal with. The leadership attrition that we have seen since independence is what we have to deal with as we continue to think about uh, leadership renewal as we continue to think about accountability uh, and transparency and putting the citizenship aspect at the center uh, or at the core of our, our discourse. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Uh, Chennai, your three minutes of uh, winding up. Any further reflections? Um, I think um, what we can all take away from this is obviously the continued plunder that is happening in the country and uh, um, we need to make a conscious decision of whether what what role we all can take towards cessation of these activities you know because i don't believe that yes it looks a bit it, yes it looks hopeless now but I think we can all try and at least secure our future and, and you know, get a, a better sense of where we are going. Currently, the government of the day has got no appetite in the first instance to do things right, no appetite for transparency, no appetite for development, you know. Um, as long as the money keeps coming in through debt accumulation, then that strategy will, will continue to be our status quo at the you know, at the behest of, of proper, true progressive development. So we all need to kind of really, you know, play our part with the upcoming elections, especially, because that is the one sure way that we can actually change things um, in, in, in our country. Because after 42 years, we are actually getting, you know, it's getting worse and not better. Not only is there an appetite to increase this reckless borrowing, but also there's limited access in terms of our choices. So like we mentioned, the more responsible lenders will not talk to us. Private sector investors will not talk to us. So we, we again need to make um, a conscious decision towards how do we actually change? How do we change that so that we have better policymakers? We have those that are not just self-seeking, but are seeking to do things that are you know, better for everyone. I think if in the eventuality, this is what it comes down to. Thank you, Chennai, and thank you, Janet, thank you, Tendai. Both Gamu and Macheka posed a profound question. We don't have a straight answer to it. The question is, what can we do? What can we citizens do? We need to mobilize. It can start at the individual level. We're all represented by members of parliament in the different constituencies that we live. They may belong to the ruining party or the opposing party. There are members of parliament who represent us. It's a very pointed statement Janet makes. Bills pass through parliament. They are not passed by parliament. What are these people doing in our name there? 
these endorsements and condonations of these evil borrowings that are impoverishing us. So the action may start at the individual level, at the local level, it will fan out like ripples in a pond until we connect nationally and we make the impact that brings us change. I see Emmanuel has his hand up. I am happy to give you half a minute. Emmanuel. Okay. Can you, yes, can you hear me? Thank, I can thank hear you. you. Thank much. you. Thank you very much, uh, citizens, and all protocol observed. Uh, I would like to, for us to send this message to the people on the ground, the citizens. I don't know how we can try and make a way forward uh, on making people aware of such, because this is a critical, this is very critical what was dis uh, discussed here. I think people, when they say three billion was stolen, they don't understand. Well, what, what really is going on. Let's show them the gravity and the real nature of this stealing, what is doing to the people. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Emmanuel. Uh, amplifying the original question about what can we do. Uh, the Little Red Book used to pose the question, what is to be done? It is turned around a little bit to what can we do? We must continue engaging this question. I'm going to ask Tony Rilla to uh, pass a vote of thanks to all of us on behalf of SAPES and uh, Research Advocacy Unit. But uh, before I do that, let me thank you all for bearing with me and for enduring my dictatorship. I was uh, delighted to have the opportunity and I hope I managed to guide our discussion correctly. Uh, Tony Rila, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simba. Um, and despite my remark saying that you were a dictator, I thought you were a very, very fine uh, chair for this extremely important session. I think it's rare that we might have a discussion on debt and corruption where we have two former ministers of finance to guide us through the exigencies of where we now stand. So firstly, thanks to Sim, and thank you very much uh, for guiding us through a, re a really, really very important discussion. Thank you to Tendai uh, for the detail. Um, in all the work that you do, uh, it's commented on the press as sound bites, but not the detail. And I want to assure you that from the policy dialogue, we will capture all these words and all the words of all the speakers so that this might be more widely available in the detail. Thank you to, to Janet, as always, for posing the political economy question and the uh, implications, what it means for us today, and also the implications for the future. But as everybody has pointed out, the debt is the debt for the future. And in a country where nearly 70% of the, the population are young, this is the debt that they will have to assume. And thank you to Chennai. Uh, and thank you for interesting case studies when uh, Tendai pointed out that we needed to have detailed analysis. Your three case studies were very important and point the way to the future for the kind of analysis that we need to do. So I think this has been a very interesting uh, discussion. It's a very important discussion as we go forward. And we will uh, transcribe this and we will try to turn this into a policy dialogue that makes it readable for everybody. And to point out, and I'm closing on behalf of Ibo, who unfortunately cannot be here for the end, he's dealing with a uh, funeral, uh, that there will be two more uh, policy dialogues in the future. The next one is to deal with foreign direct investment in Zimbabwe and why it does or doesn't happen. And following that, we will return to the SAPIs and RAO dialogues and elections and we'll be focusing on the really crunchy questions right now of delimitation and the voters' role. So thank you, Simba. 
Thank you, Tendai. Thank you, Chennai. Thank you, Janet. Thank you, everybody who participated, the people who commented, and see you uh, at the next time. <laughs> Bonapango <laughs>